Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And I'm Tom Scholey. Let's talk EC Comics for a bit. But first, Jimmy, what do you have? Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, where you can download out-of-print zines and mini-comics like this 2013 Street Angel sketchbook. You can also find a lot of my original art, scripts, process, basically see how I make the comics I make, like Street Angel, Octobriana, and a lot more at Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Tom, what you have, man? Here's Jack Kirby, the epic life of the king of comics, and you can find out how he got caught up in those Senate hearings. His... His comics being put side by side with those EC Tales from the Crypt horror comics. Uh, something he never thought he'd see happen in a million years. I also have Fantastic Four Grand Design. Uh, everything you need to know about the Fantastic Four is here. Um, you got it all. And I also have a, a YouTube channel called Total Recall Show. Red Room Comics in the wild, man. The, the, the stepchild of, uh, of EC Comics. Every issue completely self-contained. Murder on the dark web for fun and profit is the name of the game in Red Room Comics. Want to thank the Kayfabe community, Jim Rugg, for the cool uh, variant covers for Goose and Those Numbers to issue four, making them uh, nearly as popular as issue number one. Uh, you could get these comics at your local comic shop or directly from Fantagraphics at my link tree in the description below this video. Or go to my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor for $3. You get the complete archive of Red Room Comics as I serialize them every Tuesday with new strips. More than 100 pages worth of content up there as we speak. We're into the fifth issue, almost going to the sixth. Fellas, do we need an excuse to talk about uh, EC Comics? And this book called uh, Tales from the Crypt, uh, the official archives, um, to me this is like... The budget version of that like two hundred dollar Tashin book that came out last year that every that we all want but might not have the budget for. You could get this at a very affordable price, and it's got everything you need in in, in here. Which did you guys encounter first, the comics or the TV show? TV show, but because of the popularity of that show, uh, Russ Cochran was able to get newsstand distribution for uh, those 64 page reprints that were ganged up where it would be it would be a horror book to set it off and it would be the front cover and then at the halfway point the center spread of the comic it would be like like a sci-fi sci-fi or a crime suspense stories or something like this uh unbelievable comics the craft in there at a time when i'm drawing you know from these like you know nes cards to try to figure out how to draw or like Todd McFarlane drawings to try to draw a Wally Wood drawing from there, or to try to draw this Jack Davis Crypt Keeper face. I don't. I, maybe I don't have a shot at becoming a cartoonist <laughs> when I grow up. Those Russ Cochran reprints were pretty cool. Um, just, I mean, the content itself. But then in the back, they'd have the letter columns where it would be like new letter columns, and kids would be sending in their drawings of like the HBO Crypt Keeper and stuff. Yeah, man. Yeah, the comics are what I I got hold of first. I didn't really? I didn't even have cable until I was okay. probably like, I don't know, 12 or 14 or something like that. So I, I still distinctly remember we would have Christmas Eve at my aunt's house and, and, and all the family would be there. And I kept bugging my parents, we have to go. We got to go home, man. Because it was that Christmas episode <laughs> of uh, Tales from the Crypt. And, and they were pimping it on HBO so much. We got to go. We gotta go home. I gotta see Doctor Giggles playing playing uh, uh, a demented Santa Claus. Man, you got your early pulp stuff. We gotta prime the pump for there to be the possibility of comics. But the comic was created by Max Gaines. He worked at a at a printing facility, Eastern Colored Printing, and he's like sort of in the midst of the depression, trying to figure out we have this asset. How can we? How can we stretch this to like turn a profit in some way? Uh, the entire size of the comic was contingent on his discovery that you could take the sort of newspaper comic, fold it once, fold it one more time. You have something that's the size of like the Golden Age comic. Slice it at the top, man. Put a staple down the middle. That's how you get the, the eight page signature, uh, all, all that sort of thing. The uh, the original comics were selling hokum. You know, they were being packaged with like almost like Cracker Jack advertising or something, man. And then eventually he got the idea, put a ten cent sticker on it. Let's test it out on some news newsstands. Thirty five thousand copies of that first run, and you see established names. Dell. Uh, he gets kicked out of that spot. Here's some bullshit. Yeah, 
I didn't know this until after we started this this station, yeah. this channel, uh, and I found it in a wizard or something. You know, like Max Gaines. Holy shit! Everything yeah. that you did the comics, and uh, also it's it's bad news that the history is uh, of comics is not more clearly written. That I'm love comics. I'm interested in comics history, and I'm still 40 before I even learned this. This the guy who invented comics. All right. <laughs> He also uh, was connected with the DC guys, man. So he was responsible for, uh, you know, the Wonder Woman comic. If you look at those old Wonder Womans, the, uh, oh, that's a Superman. Uh, they were Leroy lettered. Um, huh. And that is a, a, a tool that he brought to the game that just kind of carried over. Well, they into... bury the lead. Everybody passes up on Superman except Max Gaines. Yeah. I mm -hmm. mean, he's, again, like... Jeez, has, has anybody contributed more to comics than Max Gaines? Whenever you think about, it. he invented the comic book, and then he greenlit Superman. Yeah, unbelievable. And then he, and then he's responsible indirectly for Mad Magazine. Yeah, like, yeah. That, I mean, that that part of the story is really interesting with like Bill Gaines. Where and you, there's other instances of this in other fields where it's like somebody's the, the son of somebody, and then create like t take things to a whole other level. Vince McMahon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, man. Like, like uh, you know, he created the comic. What we know as the comic pamphlet, he d he did some things, man. But when he had educational comics and he's doing his Bible stories, they're in debt. That shit is not <laughs> si singing, man. And those are the original EC comics, yeah. educational comics. Yeah, they would be graphic novel size. They're like they're they're 120 page books sometimes. You know, they're big, thick, thick comics. And you know, the little rich kid, you know, the little Lord Fauntleroy, Bill Gaines. He's a goof off. So when his pops gets his head chopped off or whatever happens in that boating accident, mom is like, you got to be, you're the heir apparent. Mm -hmm. And uh, he doesn't know what the heck to do, man. So he just starts having fun. Maybe, maybe we kill picture stories from the Bible and, you know, we play the hits, man. What's, what's popular out there? Romance. So you turn your like superhero chick into a um, romance comic. Saddle justice becomes saddle romances. It's it's when the crime comics begin that things get interesting, fellas, man. Because in Crime Patrol, there's same format. Yeah, right? that's the look right there. Same format of the issues, uh, like you know, three, four short stories, and uh, in this one issue of Crime Patrol, there's one uh, Crypt of Terror story. Here's your introduction to the Crypt Keeper. Boy, when those letters came in, I think we're gonna have to switch models now. He's the Popeye. Of, of this. This Johnny Craig cover, if you take a look at the original, he's he's pulling the rib on Bill Gaines, and she's got no panties on, man. <laughs> it has a big old fucking 50s bush sticking out of her cod piece. So so that's a strategic caption. Yes. <laughs> There's like a rip in it and stuff. It's real funny. There we go. We've got the early issues of the, of the, of the three yeah, uh, horror hosts. We're off to the races. And you see the genericness, man. Like, like the Johnny Craig stuff, it's very... Verily, cut like boilerplate. You know, this looks like it could be a generic cover of like one of the knockoffs. Yeah, because it's still so restrained and everything. Yeah, yeah. The, the the old is that the old witch or the uh... haunt of fear is technically old witch, but that green is the vault keeper. Okay, yeah. Oh, that's the old witch back there. Okay, so because I thought that for a second I thought this was the old witch, and I'm like, oh yeah, she's got a ways to go before she gets her like iconic, you know, giant eye look. Yeah, yeah, that's the vault keeper. Even though that is the old witch's book. One of my favorite storylines in all of these comics is watching like when something catches on. Yes, and it's like, yeah. oh, pivot this direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and do three of them. And, yeah, and almost explode, you know, as they as they sort of catch up with the public demand. Like in, in our own work, be on the lookout for that. You know, totally. It's a, it's a great lesson. Totally, man. Uh, it gets into the introduction of Feldstein and, and bringing him to the process. Man talks about the the conception of the stories and and how that works out. It's such an interesting process, too. So different than most of the comics that uh, you know that, that we read. Introducing the the sci fi comics, which was their true passion. There's that little bit here where they uh, cribbed a Ray Bradbury story, mm -hmm. and Bradbury was kind of cool about it. Sent them a letter. It was like, you guys didn't send me the $50. Yeah, I was going to say, sent them an invoice. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting why this stuff doesn't catch on. Because you think of the illustrators that they have on staff for these sci-fi books. And then also, like, you think of pulps and sci-fi as, like, prose being so popular and successful. 
and the comics just don't they don't connect in that way for some reason and I, I wonder if it's because you're taking some of the fun mystery of when you read about it and it's in your head versus now you're seeing it on a page now, now you say it it's 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 a it's a bastard in the middle because you also have the atomic age flicks so like do you want to watch it on a big screen go down or do you want to read something like this it seems like Personally, a formula that should work yeah i guess is what i'm sitting here looking at you know and it's it's a wonder and you know this is the old school right so maybe this failure only sold four hundred thousand copies yeah. uh, a That's month true. or something the list of the bradbury stories that were licensed for the ec publication you know what the, the thing is with that sci-fi stuff it just kind of like excludes half of the equation you know it's it's kind of it, it's kind of you know, guy stuff, you know, it's kind of like boys club kind of stuff. It's definitely on the pulpy side of the sci-fi rather than, you know, maybe the the more interesting ideas that I think successful sci-fi often ex exploits. Gotta have your suspense stories, man. Crime and shock. And here are the bits where they start to get a little bit of a... Uh... Uh, so, social commentary, man. We got the dude with the monkey on the back. Great cover with the hair on needle. <laughs> How about this first starting issues? to get into your covers that are much more salacious? Like, you, think of what? that on the stand. What's crazy, too, is that that's a Feldstein, and I think of him as, like, a very plasticky, Charles Burns-ish, more restrained guy, but that, that's a pretty fresh freaking It's cover. great in several ways. Like, look at the color, how much that pink just pops yeah. off of your blues oh, and, yeah. and your night scene. Oh, yeah. It's two panels, too. It's going to show up on it's a, lurid. On a, on a uh, spinner rack. I, I, you know, I, I came to this... Like, I came to the HBO show before I came to the comics, so when I'd see like the comics in an episode or whatever, I'd be like, oh, this is fake. Because there's, like, th this is a fake comic because there's no way in the 50s where it's like, leave it to Beaver that they would have something this crazy and intense. And then to find out that, no, this this is what comic books were in the 50s. It, yeah. it was a real awesome revelation. Really pushing some things, man. Really pushing some things. Here goes Johnny Craig dressed up like the horror host. <laughs> this image of him right here, I feel like he looks like Flea from Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. This is where they mentioned that the Leroy lettering system was inherited from Max Gaines, who used it in the the Wonder Woman comics. And Gaines says that he, you know he, if he had it to do over again, he probably would after seeing the the Kurtzman bits. Mm -hmm. But it's just frankly impossible to have yeah. this Feldstein amount of dialogue in a hand lettered format. Impossible to read that. Also, this is just ridiculous. Yeah, it's hard to believe that that's that's you know like that's the weird fifties comic piece that I look at and think like, oh man. No wonder Wally Wood had to create a twenty-two panels that always work because you just have to try to make this work for your damn self. Yeah, it's postage stamp sizes too. Like, look at the little tiny bits that you're drawing in whenever those are your page um, sizes. Makes me think of those like uh, two-man comics that Crumb and, and uh, Robert Crumb and Charles Crumb did, where it would just be this avalanche of words, and then <laughs> almost like it just replaced the pictures. I mean, these stories are extremely accessible. Like, I've found, anecdotally, to be extremely accessible to, like, non-comics readers. Because, yeah. again, it's like, words. I know how to read words, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you could get by with very little uh, relying on the images. Marie Severin, the colorist of EC Comics, did this uh, incredible portrait of everybody yeah it's awesome i was wondering i bet it's done later on mm. hmm. like looking back rather than like yeah okay, everybody maybe still. commission from somebody or mm -hmm. some publication or something i mean i could be wrong but that's mm. a great piece i do love it now they're talking about the star system so little bits about each of the artists man and just looking at this shit you just know man that's ghastly graham ingles mm -hmm. can't mistake it dude he can't draw a, an attractive person <laughs> and they all have those eyebrows that's an interesting quote. The idea of comparing Bill Gaines to like a, like a studio head. Mm -hmm. uh, you He's know, got his players. The man. artist where you're right. He's the David O. Selznick of comics. Jack came in. He would. He's he's the most rooted in, in like romance comics. Cute people. Like you don't get monsters from Jack Jack came in. And this gets into tropes. So like, mm -hmm. there's a whole page on two headed guys, <laughs> man, and conjoined <laughs> twins and stuff. Yeah, it's so the much fun before you figure out the, the formula, you know? It's, it's so much fun. Like, anything can happen in these comics. You know, even when you know the formula, you really don't exactly guess the, mm -hmm. the end. You know yeah. who's going to die, but they always hit you with a little something. Mm -hmm. They give you a little something. It's cool seeing, like, where they're pulling their ideas from whenever you're churning out, I don't know how many books were coming out in a month and four stories a book. You know, you would need to have some of these go-to systems 
I mean, they had to be creating yes. more, writing more than one story a day. Yeah, for sure, man. Just introducing the Kurtzman books. A lot of these images are the like late period stuff, man. So these would be like in those picto fictions okay. whenever they pivot. Mm -hmm. But I think this is a cover to uh, Impact. This is super early Wally Wood, where you can't almost wow. can't even tell that that's him. Yeah, I he, he didn't that. have that like old English style. Uh, um, signature. This is in one of those Russ Cochran's. I remember pulling that off the shop and save rack, man. Is this uh, Reed Crandall? Absolutely. This and, and then that is this too. is like the turducken. <laughs> you know, like what's that from? Oh, well, turduck is just like you have a turkey with a chicken inside. Oh, right, it. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. I always thought that like Feldstein's important to Burns. Can't confirm that. It makes sense to me. I always think of his work as having like a certain stiffness to it. Yeah. Which I don't. That probably doesn't sound good or like a right. compliment, but no. it does. It, it, there's another word for it that he has, but it's a very like a reality or yeah, something. like a posed a quality, three, like some 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 quality. Yeah. You know, all like like we could talk about like the drawbacks of all of these different artists, but like I love each one of them. Me too. For their thing, and, and and even Feldstein. Like I, like when I I'm very happy when I see like a Feldstein yeah, I have cover no and with the you Feldstein. know his. One of the things I like most about his work is um, the drapery. Like, I've, I've studied uh -huh. his drapery a lot of times, man. I feel like these are Franklin Mint sets right here, man. Mm -hmm. You know, Wally Wood and Joe Orlando with that famous image that we all know from, from, from Watchmen. Watchmen, yeah. And I think it is the EC... I think it is the EC office. Or was that like a doctored photo? Yeah, maybe like the DC office. <laughs> Jack Davis, man. Doing his thing. Yeah, what a team. Nice like, southern gentleman drawing shit like this. Like, that had to make him a small pariah in the company. Do you remember that issue of Blab where where Klaus is drawing, like, the famous drunkards of <laughs> comics history? And several of them are EC guys, and uh, and they cite them as being, like, like just seeing the, on the news every day how comics are destroying, you know, kids' psyches and stuff, and you're the guy responsible for that? And you're just trying to make a living? I wonder if any of them felt, like, genuine guilt, like, if they... That's what I'm into, like if they bought into that that yeah. argument and were like, "Oh man, I really am causing," that. as opposed to like, "Oh, this is a witch hunt." That's whatever. what they say. That's what they say about uh, Graham Ingalls. You know, he doesn't do comics after this, yeah. and and he just big time downward spiral. When Kurtzman did horror comics and stuff, they're really good. His his uh, sci fi comics in the early weird science are excellent as well. Mm -hmm. He. He completely does his own strips, has Ben Oda hand letter them. They stick out. Uh, he plays with timing a lot. In, uh, in There's one story in particular that's really freaking cool that plays with time in, in, in relation to comic panels. Makes total sense to me. Yeah. That he'd be good at any genre exploration. Johnny Craig was one of the first guys that I really responded to with the EC stuff. Yeah. Um, it's tight. It's clean. I, I see a little bit of Charles Burns in some of his stuff. I see a little bit of Dan Klaus in some of his stuff. You would really like hear his name a lot when 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 Frank Miller's talking about Sin Cities and things. You know, Johnny Craig's the name that comes up. He was the one guy who was able to write his own stuff outside of the Feldstein system. You know, they would have some other writers come through. Rarely would an artist write his own piece. I guess maybe Wally Wood did that one famous joint, but Craig would would write his own stuff. And sometimes by being the guy writing his own stuff, he would be able to do some innovative splash pages every now and then. Play to his strengths. Yeah, that that like story where like the guys like in the sewer drowning in water. Like that that's the one Miller cites and and like that that's a Miller setup, a, a sewer full of water. <laughs> Graham Ingalls, man, super important like for drowning's wrestling. not enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to keep escalating it. Sewer water, yeah, man, gray water. Ugh. Super important piece of the Bernie Wrightson puzzle here, man, is is uh, ghastly Graham Ingalls. And look at that, man. Those are dead eyes. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of eyes you need. I feel <laughs> like that's a kayfabe uh, setup too, man, because sure. that looks like a color plate, like a like a oh, color guide wow. or something. Okay. I see value in there. The young, the young sc scrappy kids, man. Young Al Williamson, probably barely twenty years old. This is a good story. I think I think we covered this actually in one of our Halloween episodes. That was included. Jack came in the sexy artist. Marie Severin doing the color seps. The first uh, EC horror I read is still my favorite, and I think it was in like that 
comics book. It was like the origin of the old witch. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, that like blew my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the the, the sort of consummation of a vampire and a werewolf, mm -hmm. and you and you get the old witch. These were always cool, and these were included in a lot of those Russ Cochran uh, reprints that were on the stands, where it would be Feldstein and Gaines doing kind of like comedic shit, where you would get to see. The guys in the bullpen doing their thing, man. Famous Harvey Kurtzman, uh, mortician kind of caricature. Can't talk EC without talking mad. And I think eventually we're going to go through all these issues. And, you know, and, and like the cover is sort of like a direct reference to like their horror stuff. Yeah. It's like, here's a goofy horror. Well, the first issue of Mad, it wasn't playing with specific pop culture references. It was basically a parody of EC Comics as mm -hmm. a company. There was a horror department, a crime department, sci-fi department, and, like, you know, one other thing. Western. Western, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that would be the Two-Fisted Tales. And then it's when they when they arrive at this place. Yeah. All bets are off, man. Like, they're going to start branching out and doing more pop culture stuff. Starting off with comics, though, makes perfect sense. Yeah. Use the medium. And, I mean, the same way Superman was, like, the atom bomb that set off... Super Duper Man is, like, you know, the atom bomb setting off mad. Krigstein. See, he didn't get a little biographical piece. I, I totally referenced this in, in issue four of uh, of uh, Red Room. I, th once again, this was one of the Cochran uh, reprints that would have been on the stands. And when I saw that, that was probably the most ghastly image it's, it's I ever gross. seen in comics. Pretty fucking gross. Is this... Is this the story where they make like soap out of people or something? Mm, and I mean, this is I, just the I, guy. I, yeah, I don't in remember. An acid bath. Yeah, no, it's uh, piranhas. Oh, piranhas. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's piranhas. I, I forget what what gets him there. What he did that mm -hmm. was bad. Here goes your knockoffs. So clearly knockoffs. Like in a lineup, you would never choose one of these, <laughs> man. Compared to that stuff, though, I look at these, and if I ever see them, I will grab them. <laughs> like that's some cool, cool. It it, it feels like um. Man, think of, who, think of who you're selling to, though, too. It's like, you want your you, the kids to buy these? Like, they're not that discerning. I'm sure that, yeah. you know, kids would be as likely to grab one of these. And, and I bet some of these would even perform better, you know, yeah. on average. And I, I stand by, like, horror is most effective when it's done ineptly. You know, like, the, like a bad drawing of horror is super creepy in a way that, like, craft, well-crafted images are not. You're yeah, 100% right said. on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you start to in, in, infer things upon the artist. Like, what kind of a psychomaniac is that? Yeah, it's almost like you want to get be some looking at this. fetish quality into that, into into your finished uh, horror art. Bill Gaines do's and don'ts of horror. Uh, That's fun. You know, we have no ghosts, devils, goblins, or the like. We tolerate vampires and werewolves. <laughs> if they follow tradition, we love walking corpses. We'll accept the occasional zombie or mummy. And we relish in Conte's Cruels, which... Asterisk, that means tells of sadism. <laughs> now, I, I read this quote, or like a portion of this quote, a long, long time ago, like early in my artist journey, and that idea was really interesting to me about how important it is to like know what you don't want to do, you know? I think they did ghosts before, uh, like in like the early ones. Mm -hmm. and, and it just didn't work. It just, it's like, this is a visual medium, and you're going to mess with some uh, some invisible nonsense? Yeah, leave the ghosts to, like, Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby and stuff. Like, we're doing the hardcore stuff. So, uh, I, then they start to pull out some, like, Comics Code Authority shit, and it's, like, show notes, scenes of torture, no whipping, and just, like, all uh -huh. the bits that are from the comic. Great. Don't put anybody's eyes out. Well, look <laughs> what Ghastly Graham is doing right there, man. Yeah, 110 times worse than, than what you would imagine. <laughs> Never show a hypodermic needle. Don't roast anybody alive. You know, and and uh, you know when when you hear about um, Wortham for the first time, like I, like I didn't know about him in the context of this. So you hear about this guy saying like, "Oh, comics are bad for kids," and, and you kind of think of what that means. And then you see this stuff, and you're like, <laughs> "Okay, I, I'm kind of getting the argument now." You know, it's almost like all those like those weird fringe guys who have seventy five percent of an argument that you agree with. Yeah, but then they take it to that extra piece, and we're talking about you know, uh, you know, gay frogs getting created that way from fluoride in the water and shit like that, and then it's like hard pass. I, I read Seduction of the Innocent. It was in the Homestead Library, and there would be such specious nonsense, like where it would show just modeling of, of a shoulder, yeah. of a character, and then 
there's a blow up of the shoulder yeah. where the collarbone is connecting with and it's a vagina the, yeah yeah it's, a, it's yeah. a hairy bush and it's like uh the stories that like some of the shop owners we know who had vice cops like come in looking for obscene materials uh what all of these shop owners would say is like when you're in that field and your job is obscenity uh what, what, what's what's that whole thing if you're a hammer yeah, every, everything's, everything's a nail, a nail. Issue issue one of Panic created a whole court case and was banned in a whole st- in the state of entire state of Massachusetts because there is this like Christmas imagery which whatever they get the parody of that bear yeah. claw whatever but it's Christmas it's inviting it's it's you know holiday season type shit but there's a story that is a Mickey Spillane uh, parody that uh, the cops like the obscenity police were focusing on this woman's leg. Mm-hmm. And the people at EC were like, oh, but you have nothing to say about her getting right. shot in the stomach <laughs> like the next panel? The judge said, uh, if you if you bring something like this into my courtroom ever again, like I'm going to arrest the prosecutor. Mm-hmm. The prosecutor's going in jail. And there's some uh, thought that Walter Winchell like, created that whole thing. There was a dude that worked at EC had some connection and uh, did a big kind of hit piece on Winchell that was like multi-part mm. that sent Winchell into a, into a tailspin. I think he, I think he was like a uh, McCarthyism type dude or something, you know, some sort of gossip guy. But, you know, he set off uh, some, some of these sting operations, man, and then, you know, wrote about them in, in, in the rags. The Kefauver hearings, which are not the Kefauver hearings, but have been colloquially uh, remembered as such because Senator Kefauver was there and had yeah, interactions. Yeah, I was say, I wonder if we should be giving uh, this Senator Pertel a little harder time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah. he needs a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Direct quotes, man, of uh, the whole transcription of Bill Gaines' opening statement. Uh the harmless thrill of a love story and the sublimity of love to a frigid old maid. Like that whole bit from Comic Book Confidential that's in here. And some of the back and forth with Kefauver and Gaines about like what makes a gory comic. Uh-huh. Uh, I think we talk about amphetamines here a little bit and how everybody who was trying to lose weight in the 50s, all of your grandmas were on speed, man, <laughs> when they were taking those diet pills. This photo of uh, Wortham reading a shock illustrated stories whenever they had to pivot get rid of the comics, they tried the new trend, the piracy, the valor, impact, all that stuff. They took the true hits, made them magazines in the same way as Mad, but they didn't quite hit. But he had this photo of Wortham hanging in his office. Man, that's a tough... A t- that, that's kind of what you're talking about, Tom, with the uh, you know cartoonist just feeling shame <laughs> yeah. for what they made or whatever. I can remember hearing about cartoonists that would have been like, say, a John Buscema contemporary that age, like two generations ahead of us, I suppose, and that they would lie about their profession, you know, because they were ashamed of it. And I never thought about it going back to this. I always thought of it as just like the lowest level of commercial art for a certain generation. But it's probably more related to this Senate hearing than anything else of like, I just don't want... Yeah, you, this general distrust. Yeah, I'm at a dinner party and I don't want to be known as the guy drawing these comic yeah. books. A degenerate. Uh, right. And, and you know, so like, it might have even been a different story if you were an artist working in like Pittsburgh. You, you People might be a little impressed. But if you're at some like Manhattan dinner party... With Charles and you, Adams yeah. and, and uh, New Yorker mm-hmm. yeah, people... Right. You know, only Jules Pfeiffer's going to be like, that's sick, dude. That's so awesome. <laughs> The new trend stuff, the new direction. I always thought that color. piracy covers one of the greatest covers in comics. Super complicated to separate. Yeah. yeah. With all of that stuff, and it speaks to, you know, the visual language, the vocabulary of Bernie Krigstein to even figure that out. He he had several covers where there's a lot of uh, weird separations and stuff that that were done kind of on the plates. They had uh, they did keep a sci-fi strip going and. Gaines talks about this in Comic Book mm-hmm. Confidential, man. Uh, one of their stories completely got uh, shut down. It was a story drawn by Angelo Torres where the MacGuffin, the, 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 the shock thing at the end was the guy had a big old eyeball on his back. And something about that was a little bit too 
gross for the Comics Code Authority. So they substituted this story, Judgment Day. And the whole thing is that uh, you're sort of on board with this with this astronaut, highly respected, um, you know, the 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 content of his character is most important. You reveal that he's a black dude, astronaut. Um, you know, maybe a little ham-fisted. We go back, we read that shit, but they came from a good place. Uh, the comics code was like, no, you have to take the star shapes out of the beads of sweat. Gaines is like, fuck you guys, man. I'm running it, and I'll take you to court. They let it pass. Uh, it sees the light of day in incredible science fiction, and then from that point forward, he's like, nah, man. Magazines from now on, fuck this, fuck this Comics Code Authority bullshit. And let's end it with uh, just like a quick breeze through the cover gallery, man. If there's any, you could you could see the growth, man. Like it's it's pretty stable for a while. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. When it's Johnny Craig, when it's Elf, Al Feldstein, pretty stable, pretty stable. But then we start to get into crazy territory, man. We're getting there, dude. Feldstein sets it off. And once... Some some real bangers over here. Yeah. Like the guy being ready to be electrocuted and like close up on his arm strapped <laughs> down. Well, dude, with a wet sponge. Yeah, that's what I'm right saying. There. Like the detail's great. And then this is amazing for negative yeah. space, the guy buried alive. You know, if Jack Davis would have drawn this, though, there would have been keys and a treasure chest yeah, and like some skulls and stuff. And stuff. <laughs> this one was always pretty arresting to me. Yeah, it's uh, kind of like uh, Captain America <laughs> showing up in ice. And I think it's uh, Frankenstein. Frankenstein, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, again, like there was like the movie Creep Show. Oh yeah, and it was like, oh yeah, well these are fake movie comics. There were obviously never comics anything like this in real life. You know, it's neat which ones like stand out at this small size. Like that one's pretty pretty strong. Mm -hmm. Guy in front of the fire, easy easy to read at this reduced size. Sure, this one's pretty iconic. Yeah, yeah, that's that one about the horse, <laughs> the H, the monkey on the back, and it's like you know, like our ideas about the fifties, like growing up in the eighties and whatever. It's like um, it's like, oh, well, like, our parents didn't know about any of this stuff, but it's like, okay, like, people are coming out of, like, World War II, they saw, like, every horror imaginable, it's not, you know, like, this stuff didn't just get invented in the 70s, you Right. Know? Man, that one of the guillotine is pretty, pretty, uh, that's a, that's a very clear graphic moment, and that blade <laughs> being white right in the middle, so your eye goes straight to it, that's pretty strong. I think this is a Cruel's Conte's story <laughs> in there, man. The origin of, of the of the Crypt Keeper. Yeah, we actually have a video about this. Yeah, they oh, include, that's a great they one, include yeah. about four four stories in here, man. Got a Feldstein. This is like one of the most beautiful. Yeah, that's a great I, grand I, grand I, grand love, I love angles. I love his stuff. One of the exercises that they give you in art school is, and it's about understanding planes and stuff. Is like do a wireframe of a face, like like draw the object that you're drawing, and then and then. Like show us the planes mm -hmm. of the thing, so because it can inform your hatching and and your shading and your thoughts on sure, lighting, yeah. and you're seeing a direct. It, it's like etchings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything has like a sculptural quality. Every everybody looks like they're made out of melting wax. And then and then think about uh, Wrightson's Frankenstein plates. Mm -hmm. You know where he's basically, you know, doing a less vulgar version. The the sad thing is in life, like I've. I've known some people who look like Ghastly Graham figures, man. Mm -hmm. Like, I know this guy. Um, and, and Engels is kind of, like, he's so masterful, but it does have a little bit of, like, an amateur quality to You know, that, that yeah. sells the horror really well. Let's, let's end it with uh, fandom, because this is a fandom mm -hmm. uh, uh, podcast, YouTube channel. Um, the, the fandom was, was explosive. You know, I mean, is this... Uh, I, I almost thought that was uh, Clive Barker. Uh, but, you know, they had correspondence, letters pages in, in the comics. There were uh, famous fanzines like uh, Squatron and Spafon that I think still get published uh, every now and then. Well, imagine you're a kid in the 50s and this stuff's in your life and you love it. And then it goes away. Like, where else are you... There, there was nowhere else to get anything remotely like this. Yeah, there would be the paperbacks. And, man, I'm, I'm connected with the EC Fan Addicts on uh, Facebook. And I that's the only uh, group that I, that I visit. And there's all sorts of 
shorthand talk, like the good paperbacks and uh, things like that. So like these comics had these extra lives that made it possible for, for, um, for like y uh, the next generation to like discover that stuff. And if you discover one of those paperbacks, why not look for the original source? You know, it might even be at a time when you could find them just at like secondhand stores for, you know, 30 cents or something. You know, th that like sort of idea, that like vague notion everybody has of that, that there's like this secret history to the world that isn't in the history books that we're not, we don't know about and stuff like this, this was like the first instance to me of like, wow, there is some like bigger world that, that the grownups just aren't telling me about. Yeah, you know? sure. I always like question my folks, like, like, you know, Russ Meyer movies existed. You don't know who Russ Meyer is. You don't know who the Ramones are. You don't know what he tells from the, like, like, who are you guys? Uh, let's let's end it there, man, because then it starts getting into Hollywood, and this is cartoonist yeah. kayfabe. But once again, man, uh, you don't got the budget for that Tashin book? Go scoop this one up. It'll give you a lot of cool, incisive analysis about the history of uh, of EC Comics, you know, all the way up to uh, Max Gaines and the Pulps. Anything? Any final notes, gentlemen? Kayfabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, what's out there? Join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, where you can download out-of-print zines and mini-comics. I have about a dozen of those available now. You can see original art, scripts, process, how I make the comics I make, like Street Angel and Octobriana. Join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Check out Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics, Fantastic Four Grand Design, and my YouTube channel, Total Recall Show. Red Room Comics in the Wild, uh, four issues uh, on the stands as we speak, including the uh, free comic book day comic, go to your lo local comic shop, scoop them up, order them from Fantagraphics at my link tree in the description below. Hit up my Patreon if you want to read the comics before they hit paper. Patreon.com slash Ed also in the link tree in the description below this video. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Given those margin orders, Jimmy, we're going to be on our way. Make more comics.